Uh, today, we're going to talk about what exactly is pollination. We'll talk about why Coleoptera, that is the beetles, is so specious with smiley face. Um, I'll do a quick taxonomic overview of Insecta and Coleoptera as a whole, because insects and beetles are just so cool. And then I composed all oh, about a dozen slides of the common beetles present in Idaho <clears throat> and the ones you're likely to see. And hopefully I'll leave time for some questions. Uh, top right we have right here is the uh, locust borer, which is a pestiferous insect, but as an adult, it's here feeding on these flowers. And then bottom right, um, we have a carrion beetle, a sylphid, which is there feeding on uh, flowers as well. So what is pollination? Um, in essence, it's plant sex, right? It's the sexual reproduction for plants, i.e. meiosis, where we're splitting those gametes. Um, gene mixing means we have healthy plant populations. So pollination is absolutely critical. The male parts, we have the anther and the filament. And those gametes, are half of the ploidism is going to be in the pollen. Uh, the female, we have the stigma, and then the gametes are the ovule or the egg. And we can kind of see them here. Here's the anther, the filament, the pollen grain itself. It's going to land right on that stigma, have some pollen tubes, and go down. So that is what pollination is. Um, after our talk with uh, Dr. Rob Laporte here, I had to put in here a note on polyploidism. Um, polyploidy is very common in the plants. Okay, and this helps speciation and probably radiation of plants through the terrestrial ecosystem. There are a lot of mechanisms behind this. And what this essentially is, is doubling, tripling, quadrupling, or more of the regular wild type genome. Okay, uh, and a lot to be, is to be learned by scientists over the upcoming decades. But what this does is it often results in physiological changes, which means larger flowers and or fruit. Up here at the top, you see a diploid, a tetraploid, and then an octoploid. That is getting bigger, that flower is. Um, and one of the most common fruits you might eat is a strawberry. Compared to the wild type, the octoploid is very, very large. And we have wheat, which is, which is a hexaploid and then watermelon seedless, and then bananas are triploids. So I think polyploidism is pretty cool in plants. Um, here is a nice diagram of what I call the tree of life or what scientists might refer to as the tree of life. Top right, um, we have bacteria. Uh, we are learning a lot more about bacteria in the upcoming decades. Uh, this group is quite large, as you can see. Then we have archaea. These are very old organisms. And then we have our group, um, the eukaryotes, right? The multicellular organisms. And I like this graph at the bottom because right in the middle, it has millions of years ago. So we're talking anywhere from 4.2 billion years ago. And then out to today, we have the bacteria branch. And then eukaryotes are right in here, all about one billion years ago. Then we have plants, fungi, protosomes, fish. Uh, the insects are right here, amphibians. And then humans are right here at the very tip. So we're, we've just been around for a little bit. A taxonomy refresher. I like to always take a step back and realize, um, what are we all talking about? So the tree of life is divided into this, where we start with our domain. Um, we're talking eukaryota here, multicellular organisms. The kingdom is animals for this organism, the beetle, of course. The phylum is arthropoda, the arthropods, the class insecta, all the insects, used to be hexapoda. The order is coleoptera, um, that is the sheep winged insects. And this guy at the right, this convergent lady beetle, is in the family coccinellidae. The genus Hippodamia and the species Convergens. I always like to think of disturbed King Philip came over for green soup is how we would remember those as an acronym. So 
uh, life on Earth, biodiversity as a whole. Uh, this graph on the right compromises all the living species we have on the Earth. And they're divided into their respective groups. Uh, the most, the biggest and the most speciose, of course, is 19. That is our insects. Uh, we have more than a million species described. Okay, so that is represented by the big beetle, which I love. 18 is all the plants. So we have quite a number of plant species, 320,000, 350,000. Um, if we threw on our non-insect arthropods, which is 17, um, we combine that with the insects, we're probably talking 60 to 62% of all species on Earth. So insects have been very, very uh, great at diversifying themselves. They basically did this with a cuticle, a tracheal system. Um, wings are present. So this is found in the beetles. We also have holometabolous development, those four life stages. We see that in the beetles as well. We have specialized mouth parts uh, that is critical for the beetles. And as far as speciation is concerned, um, we have evolutionary flexibility of key structures. Um, for me, and when you take a step back and look at beetles, this would be the forewings, those elytra that are protecting those hind wings that fly. So that's really critical. And then we have a timing, um, how all these organisms came to Earth and were in terrestrial ecosystems, okay? Um, as far as timing is concerned, Insecta, this is the most specious group on Earth, and they arose, I'm gonna say, a little more than 550 million years ago. Um, Plantae or the plants was a little more than 500 million years ago. So both of these are evolving at the same time and our non-insect arthropods are right in there as well, okay? I do love this quote, and it is, if one could conclude as to the nature of the creator from a study of creation, it would appear that the creator has an inordinate fondness for stars and beetles. Because Coleoptera alone, we have a little over 370,000 species, and I think that's an incredible number. Um, a lot of entomologists actually specialize in beetles becoming coleopterous. They might just study a certain genus or genera or a species for their entire career. So beetles are fascinating creatures. So why are they so specious over the other insects? Well, uh, they can be very small to very large. Look at that uh, span from a quarter millimeter to more than 130 millimeters. Um, they have the elytra as those forewings, so they're protecting their hind wings. They have that holometabolous development, the egg, the larval stage, that pupil stage where so much is going on and they can resist desiccation. Then we have the adult stage. Uh, a lot of beetles are also highly sclerotized. So they're armored, they're thick. Um, they're like little tanks, I would say, right? And then beetles occupy a very wide array of niches. So they can be terrestrial, aquatic, semi-aquatic, predaceous, parasitic, herbivorous, fungivorous, xylophagus, which is feeding inside a wood, coprophagus, which is dung, and then saprophagus, which is their decaying, um, other decaying animals, okay? So bottom left, we have all these very weird types of larval stages for the beetles. In the center here, we have a specialized beetle that feeds on snails, in fact. Uh, bottom right, we have the largest beetle on Earth. And then up here, you have all these beautiful forms, sizes, and beetles have just been so successful as a grouping on this Earth. A quick thing about beetle morphology. Uh, this diagram on the left, divided into three segments, head, thorax, abdomen, the head has these antennae and then the crucial mouth parts. The thorax is all locomotion. That's where the wings, the elytra are, the legs, and then the abdomen, okay? Um, and then depending on the species and what it specializes in, those mouth parts are gonna be quite differing. The elytra might be really weird um, or shortened. And then you have a lot of leg modifications in the beetles.
So that's a quick morphology. And today we are not talking about the Beatles the rock band. I think uh, there needs to be a little joke in there, all right? So Beatles and pollination. Um, as far as timing occurred and evolution, they're almost certainly one of the first insect groups to visit flowers for nectar, for food, for that uh, sugar content and feeding on pollen itself. Um, we need to keep in mind that nectar is almost always the main goal with pollination becoming mutualistic or symbiotic with that species. I put in a little note about free living. Um, most beetles are free living. That is, they wander about day, sometimes in the night. They never go back to a nest, if you will. So their span and their territory that they can cover as an adult or a larva might be incredible. So that's something to keep in mind. And then beetles have a well-known mutualism with some of the ancient plant species. Um, magnolia, for example, water lilies, and then spice brush. So those are all, all kind of highlighted. And then unlike beetle, bees, uh, the beetles do not have specialized areas to carry pollen. And that would be this pollen basket on the hind leg. Um, I have not seen a beetle yet with a pollen basket and I don't think it will ever evolve, but we just need to know they're not gonna be as efficient as bees for pollination, but they're gonna play it critical role. Uh, beetles and flowers. Um, generally speaking, beetles like flowers that are bowl-shaped, okay? Um, if they're white, dull, um, yellow, green, if they have strong, fruity, volatile, organic compounds, so I put in here fruity petals at the top, uh, flowers that are open during the day because most beetles are diurnal, uh, moderate nectar production, and then typically they like flowers that are large in size, that is solitary, kind of like that magnolia flower, or clusters of small flowers. This would be the goldenrod, spirea, um, stuff like that. And beetles are known by science as mess in soil pollinators. I didn't know this until the other day. Um, they are eating through the sepals, the petals, they are feeding on that nectar or pollen, and then they often defecate within the flower. I know, kind of gross. Um, and then of course, there are beetles that can be pestiferous to our flowers, um, to our crops, to our horticulture industry. So we have a lot of numerous examples of that. Um, generally speaking though, that's gonna be the larval form of those beetles. A lot of these adults, they might be pests, as larvae, but as adults, they could be technically beneficial in our ecosystems. Um, like other well-known pollinators, the bees, right? The beetles see at unique, unique light spectrum wavelengths as well. So here at the top, we have our eyesight. Here's a beetle right here. <clears throat> it's gonna perceive flowers um, a little bit different than we see it, okay? And it's, the attraction to that flower is going to be a synergism with the plant and flower VOCs, the color, especially if it's that white, dull, yellow, those green flowers, the nectar composition, those are going to attract that beetle to that flower. Okay, and what does it mean to be free living? I kind of quickly covered this. Um, essentially, that beetle does not have that home, that nest, that refuge site that they repetitively retreat to each evening. Um, they can travel long distances over their lifespan. That is super advantageous and very key here. And then pollen loads. The pollen load on that beetle, in the hairs, under the elytra, in the mouth parts can be extremely diverse, okay? So they may specifically or inadvertently pollinate dozens to hundreds, thousands of plants per individual. I love this picture bottom right, this beetle that is absolutely covered in pollen. It's so covered that you can't even tell what it is. So that's kind of cool. Uh, the next few slides, how I organized this. Um, I put the common name, top bold, 
Um, this is for you to uh, help identify some of the beetles we might encounter. And then I have the family name or the common genera. And then I get into the descriptions of these beetles with photographs on the right. So we'll cover size, general shape, special features, especially if they're physiological, uh, whether they're common or rare, how to identify it, their main diet. And for the diet, I kind of split it up between larvae and adults, and then when and where they may be found, and then some other scientific notes, perhaps, okay? So that's how these next slides are arranged. Uh, the first beetle I wanted to talk about, uh, these are probably some of my favorite beetles often overlooked. These are tumbling flower beetles. They are in the family Mordelidae. Uh, Mordella is the genus. Uh, these are really, really small beetle, beetles. You're talking three to four millimeters. They're very slender from top to bottom. So if you look down on it, you might see this, and then you might see this tail. Uh, the elytra don't cover all the sclerites there. Uh, they're dark colored in nature, and they have a large coxa. It looks like a plate, actually, if you're really up close um, under a microscope. These are very common beetles. Again, they're small, dark color. They're kind of wedge shaped, if you will. And they will make irregular movements on the flower itself. They will, like their common name suggests, jump off and tumble down. Um, and that's for escaping predators. The adults um, are found on flowers. They're feeding on the nectar. And then larvae, it really depends. They can be pestiferous, but they're typically under the soil. And I see these in midsummer, and especially in forested ecosystems or meadow ecosystems with a lot of flowers. Okay, so that's one of the first beetles you might encounter. Uh, the second, um, we all love the lady beetles, all the master gardeners. Uh, we understand that they're very, very good. Sometimes they're called ladybird beetles. The family is Coccinellidae, okay, with numerous genera. Um, I put a couple of the genera in here. We have Anatus. These are the giant ones. Hippodamia, really common. Uh, bottom left, we have Coccinella. And then on the right, we have Harmonia, okay. Um, lady beetles, they're round. They're often red, yellow, orange. We had one in the office the other day that was black, though, uh, Skimnus. Uh, they're often saucer shaped, and that's from looking laterally. Uh, very common, small. Um, adults and larvae are predators. So even though these are predators, these beetles cover such a large territory um, per individual that they're considered accidental pollinators. And you find ladybugs in terrestrial ecosystems, okay? So even our highly beneficial predators can be pollinators. Uh, the next group of beetles that you will encounter, uh, these are the blister beetles. Meloidae is the family name, okay? They're typically black in color, though they can get metallic green, um, maybe a blue. They are slender in appearance, and often they have soft elytra or those soft coverings. Uh, this bottom center one, those elytra can be so shortened that you can't really even tell it's a beetle, but that is in fact a beetle. Uh, this group is common on flowers. They appear in large groups typically on flowers, so they're gregarious. Um, if you see these around, you're probably going to see a couple dozen of them. Um, they are called blister and oil beetles because they do produce cantharidin. Uh, which is called Spanish fly. It's an aphrodisiac, supposedly. But this is really an irritant, and it is very poisonous in large doses. So if you see these, um, don't handle them. And adults, they like flowers in the Asteraceae plant family. And then larvae can be parasitoids or parasitic of bees, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, the next group of beetles are the soldier beetles. Cantharidae is the family. Uh, they almost look similar to the previous group, Meloids, but they're more flattened. Uh, they kind of got this hairy look on the elytra. You can kind of see that. They're often black and orange. They have a distinct pronotum, in my opinion. 
kind of this trapezoidal look. Uh, their head is kind of out as well. These are active during the day on vegetation and usually found on flowers. Uh, the adults uh, feed on nectar, pollen, and their predators. So they hit all of our beneficial insect boxes. And then the larvae are predators. So if you see these out and about, very good insects, very good beetles. The next group, uh, carpet beetles, in fact. Um, these are Dermestidae. That is the family. These are small beetles. They're broad. They're round. They're covered with these uh, colored scales, with often with patterns. And they're typically brown, uh, white, blotchy. Adults are common outdoors in the spring. And this is when they're actually pollinating stuff. Okay. And I put in here early flowering pollinators. And then indoors, they can come out anytime because the larvae feed indoors. They're pests of our houses. Okay. Uh, top right, we have the genus Anthrenus. And I put those all over here. Um, even though these are pests indoors, they are beneficial outdoors for pollinators. So keep that in mind. The next group, uh, longhorn beetles, Cerambicidae. Uh, these can be small to very large beetles. They're elongated, they're slender. Um, they have long antennae. Okay, that's where they get their common name. It is a large species group. The two largest beetles in Idaho are these two. This is Prionus californicus, and then Trichonemus right here. Uh, as larvae, they are pests, okay? But, well, larvae are xylophagus. They're boring into wooden trees. They can be serious pests and structurally weaken trees. Um, sometimes they pop up in homes. They're bad for the horticulture, nursery, and forest industry. But as adults, a lot of these actually feed on nectar as a supplement. Um, you can also see some of the fun ones we have down here on the right. Neoclitus, this is the red-banded ash borer. And then on the bottom right is Clytus, which is a wasp mimic beetle, but it is feeding there on the nectar. Um, another next group, the metallic wood boring beetles. These are Buprestidae, that is the family. Uh, these are usually metallic. They're usually green. They're usually beautiful, okay? They're stunningly bright. They're sculptured. Um, they're elongated, if you will. And then they're always going to leave an oval exit hole in that tree. Larvae are again xylophagus into there. And adults are accidental pollinators. The larvae are these flat-headed borers. So if you ever see a larvae like this, it's a buprestid. And they're found near forest ecosystems. I did want to put a plug out there. We have Calcophora is one of our native ones. This is the golden buprestid. These two are native. Um, keep an eye out for a small buprestid that's very highly invasive and is on APHIS and USDA and ISDA eyes, the emerald ash borer. If you see something small boring into ash with an oval exit hole, um, just keep us in mind as far as extension or ISDA or USDA. This is a pest of those ash trees. Uh, the next group. Uh, scarab beetles. I think everyone knows what a scarab beetle looks like, uh, but these are great beetles. They're round in appearance. They sometimes can be hairy. Euphoria is the Indian flower bumble beetle. That's this one. Um, they can actually attack flowers too. I've seen Euphoria attack cup plant before. Uh, larvae are typically root feeders or they're feeding on dung. Okay, They can be serious pests of ag and horticulture. Bottom right, we have the Japanese beetle. Uh, ISDA is actually spraying right now in Caldwell for Japanese beetles, so keep on the lookout for this guy as well. Uh, they are beautiful beetles. They were highly regarded by the ancient Egyptian societies, um, but they can be pollinators, especially with those hairs and the mouth parts. Great little beetles. Uh, the next group, this group is one of my favorite. Uh, these are the checkered beetles, the clarity beetles. Um, the only genus I put in here, Trichodes. They're elongated, they're checkered, they have soft elytra, they're smaller than those cantharids and meloids, but they're hairy. No, on all of these pictures, the hairs that are coming around here. Uh, this group is large, 
They occupy numerous niches and specialties. The larvae can be predaceous. Adults, though, are predaceous and they feed on pollen and nectar if they can't find another insect to feed on. And they have voracious appetites. Um, these are also fairly common and especially in midsummer and into fall. The next group is the leaf beetles, uh, Chrysomelidae. Uh, these are round, oval shaped, could be slightly elongated, small to medium, can be extremely colorful. Look at that photograph right there. Um, they can be serious pests. Uh, some of these species are used for biocontrol of weed species. So that's a good thing. Larvae can be leaf miners or within the soil attacking the roots or stems. And this entire group is abundant from spring until fall. Um, a lot of these actually bottom right, I think that is the striped cucumber beetle. So even though they're kind of pestiferous, they will be accidental pollinators. Uh, the next group of beetles, fireflies. I get this question every year. Yes, we have fireflies here. The genus we have, though, is Elychnia, okay? And this genus does not produce those uh, lights that they have on the East Coast, the Midwest. Um, these are relatively small beetles. The head is usually highly concealed beneath this pronotum, okay? Uh, the pronotum is often colorful. It will have this red, orange, sometimes yellow markings around that margin. Uh, this is a very beneficial group. The larvae and adults are predaceous, but you will find them feeding on nectar um, as a supplement. They are day active fireflies. And again, sadly, our species don't light up, so you can't send the grandkids to fill a jar for you. I'm wrapping it all up. So those are some of the common beetles I think you will encounter while you're out and about. Polyoptera as a whole will never be as efficient as the bees for pollination efforts, okay, it's with those angiosperms. Uh, why? They don't have those bifurcate hairs. So all the bees have hairs that are split or specialized structures. Um, in some of the bees, you have scopa or that pollen basket. And I don't think these physiological structures will ever evolve. But that does not mean that beetles don't play a key role in supplemental pollination and then some specific plant species. They can be extremely important. And I think I want to note here, they are such a huge group. So worldwide, throughout our Earth, we have about 25,000 species of bees. We have more than 370,000 species of beetles. And from the research I was doing, we know that about 80,000 species of those beetles are visiting flowers at some point in their lifetime. So whether they're a larva or an adult, they're visiting those flowers. So beetles play a key role in pollination. Um, I would also note coming up in what, about a month, we have Pollinator Appreciation Week, uh, June 19th through the 25th. Um, if you want to know more about that, visit the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, pollinator.org. You can also look at xerces.org for more information. I'm sure Ada County Soil and Water Conservation District also has some great events coming up. And then I was put in a plug for integrated pest management. Um, given that some of these Beetles, even though they are accidental pollinators, might become pests. We want to always rely on an IPM toolkit where we're sampling our pests, we're forecasting, we're using thresholds. Um, if we are using insecticides, we're considering biorationals and conventionals. We use cultural, host plant resistance, mechanical control, and a biocontrol to encompass our IPM program and the goals of IPM is to minimize those adverse impacts of pest control on the environment and human health, maximize sustainability, and reduce that pest status to non-economic levels. This great graph came out in 2019 from Dara, talking about all that encompasses IPM from the economic viability, environmental safety, and the social acceptability. 
And I think as scientists, homeowners, landowners, stewards of our ecosystems, we should all take this into consideration. Um, I also put in a quick plug, me and a colleague of mine, Jason Thomas, he's in Minidoka County right here taking a photo, run this website, Idaho Insect Identification, powered by U of I Extension. The address at the top is right there. Um, we take in photos, videos, submissions all summer long, um, and this is a great, great resource. All you have to do is go to that website, click the submission form. You can upload stuff from your cell phone right to it, give us some more information, and we usually get back to you in a couple days, maybe 72 days. And with that, I will wrap it up. I know I'm three minutes over already. Sorry, Jessica. But it's important to know, know your insects, know what you're looking at. If you don't know, that's why I'm here as a resource. And I'm Brad Stokes from UVI Extension Canyon County. My email address is right there, bstokes at uidaho.edu. And feel free to contact me, call me, uh, text to me, anything like that. And with that, I would take any questions anyone might have. I have a quick question about which beetles eat squash bugs. Oh, which beetles eat squash bugs? I think there would be at least two big groups that might eat squash bugs. Uh, the ground beetles, those are the carabids. Uh, very, very common beetles. You see them all over. And then staphylinids might as well. Staphylinids are going to be our rove beetles. Um, those two, if you had an abundant amount of ground beetles on your property, uh, they might take care of some of those squash bugs. Great, thank you. Are there any other last questions? Liz, you got anything? Okay. Cool. Well, Jessica, thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you, Ada County Soil and Water Conservation District, your board for me. This has been a pleasure, okay? Thank you so much, Brad. We really appreciate this presentation. Yeah. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions, let me know, okay? Wonderful. Thank you. You all have a great day and thanks for coming. Thanks, Brad.